The story starts back in March 1946, when scientists recorded the birth of almost every baby that was born in one week. And they've been following thousands of them ever since and collecting all kinds of information about their health, their development, their income, their jobs, and much, much more. And those people turned 70 in March, and perhaps you might have seen that birthday uh, celebrated on the news. And this has become something special. It's now the longest running detailed study of human development in the world. And this study of them was so successful that scientists um, did it again. So they started following thousands of children born in one week in 1958. They did it again in 1970. They started a fourth study in the early 1990s, and then once again at the turn of the millennium. And altogether, there were over 70,000 people who've been enrolled in these studies now across those five generations. And these are called birth cohort studies, and a birth cohort is just a group of people who were born at around the same time. And no other country in the world is following generations of children in quite this way and in quite this detail. These studies have really amassed mountains of information, so many thousands of paper questionnaires, terabytes worth of computer data, freezers full of DNA and urine and blood samples and, and much, much more. And that data has become very valuable for scientists. The findings uh, have, by, by my estimate, uh, produced something like 6,000 academic papers and books over the years. And they have fed into policies around pregnancy, birth, schooling, social mobility, adult education, and much, much more, and shaped scientists' understanding of many types of issues, uh, ranging through fetal development, chronic disease, and aging. These studies have become um, the envy of scientists around the world, so sometimes uh, people call them the jewel, a jewel in the crown of British science. Um, now, you might think that if Britain had a world-leading series of studies like this, we'd have made sure that they were well looked after, well organised, um, the government would obviously ensure that they had plenty of financial support through the years. However, that's not quite how it's been. Um, so I discovered that these stories actually have a dramatic and wonderfully British story. Uh, they've been run by a cast of eccentric English men and women over the years, and often it's really been on a wing and a prayer. There have been many times when one or other of these studies have been just a step away from collapse. And that was just because scientists weren't really sure if they could get the financial and political support that they needed to keep these things on the road. So with that introduction, I'm just going to tell you now about four of the key findings which have emerged over the years um, around birth, around schooling, around smoking, and about inequality, um, each of which has ended up having quite a major impact on policy. This is one of the babies born into the very first uh, cohort with his mother in 1946. And actually, one of my favourite parts of this story is actually the very start of this first cohort study. The backstory is that it all started actually before the war um, and, and during when there were concerns that women in Britain just weren't having enough babies. The, the birth rate had been falling and the concern was that if women didn't have more babies, then there wouldn't be enough people born to sustain and rule the British Empire, which was very big at the time. Um, and some academics actually warned that if women didn't have more babies, then the British would go extinct. Now, there was lots of discussion about this, and eventually it was decided that the best way to find out why women weren't having babies was to go out and talk to them. So to do this, scientists asked health visitors to, um, to go out and interview every single mother who had given birth to a baby in this one week that I mentioned um, in March 1946. And this was across England and Scotland and Wales. And this was an incredibly ambitious exercise, which would be almost impossible today, but it was pulled off with a kind of post-war panache, and they reached over 90% of these mothers, which is about 14,000 um, babies. Now, I really love the fact that despite this being this huge survey about fertility and birth rate, um, none of these women were asked anything about sex, because that was just considered to be off the table at, at the time. Um, but it is really interesting to, to look back at these questionnaires and see what the women were asked. And they were asked things like this. Were you able to get your full extra ration of a pint of milk a day? Who looked after your husband while you were in bed with this baby? <laughs> How much did you spend on vests, petticoats, booties, bonnets, shawls, knickers, and rubber sheets for baby? And how much did you spend on smocks, corsets, nightdresses, knickers, and brassieres for yourself? You know, those questions really speak to their moment in time, um, but they proved to be really important. So they collected up all these questionnaires and all this data, 
Um, and by the time they got all of this in, uh, these original concerns about the birth rate had disappeared because, of course, the baby boom was taking off. So the original aim of the study became somewhat moot, but it turned out to be important in another way. So these questions about how much women spent on vests and petticoats and so on turned out to be important because it revealed how much it actually cost to have a baby. But in that time, no one had really done this in any detail before. Uh, but the important thing was that scientists found that um, these costs were much harder for the working class families to afford. It was taking a much bigger bite out of their income. So it exposed some of the inequalities in society. And it also showed that in another way. So it showed that um, working class mothers were receiving much worse medical care during pregnancy um, than those in, in the middle and upper classes, and that their babies were 70% more likely to be born dead. And the obvious reason for this was that the poor families couldn't afford um, good medical care because this was before the days of the NHS, so women got the medical care they could afford, and if they couldn't afford it, then they went without. So these findings attracted a lot of attention when they were published in the late 1940s, but despite these rather depressing messages about inequality, they also emerged at just the right time uh, because this was just as the welfare state and the NHS was being put together. And so these findings were able to feed into the foundations of the NHS. And when the NHS was launched in 1948, the care around pregnancy and birth became free for everybody. And also around that time, more generous maternity benefits were introduced. So, so this survey really helped create this lasting belief that pregnant women deserve support from the state. And it really means that the maternity leave and benefits, which parents receive today, is partly thanks to this survey back in 1946. And, and that I also like that story because it just shows um, how collecting these relatively mundane details about people's lives, you know, how much they spent on bras and, and corsets and so on, um, can really reveal important truths about what society is really like. The cohort studies are, are sometimes like holding a, a mirror up to Britain, um, and sometimes we don't like what we see. So um, we see inequality, for example, reflected back at us. I'm going to move on to the, to the second big finding I wanted to pull out. That was David Ward, that's the baby. Um, this, here he is as a little boy now, looking very cute. The second thing I wanted to talk about is studies which emerged as these children grew up, and it, it was around our schooling system. So after this first survey, um, scientists decided that they would continue to follow this original group of children on into their lives and collect data on them as they went. But because they actually didn't have the computing power to follow all of them, they whittled that original 14,000 children down to about 5,000, and that's how many they, they've kept following. And it turned out that this study offered a very powerful way to test whether the 11 plus exam was working. Now, that exam was introduced um, as part of the 1944 Education Act, and it was supposed to be an equaliser um, within schooling. So the idea was that the cleverest children would all pass the 11 plus and um, get to the elite grammar schools regardless of their, their social background or their class. Now, the cohort study actually showed that the 11 plus exam wasn't working the way that it should. So it revealed that bright children from the working classes were far less likely to do well at school and were less likely to pass the 11 plus exam than were equally bright children from the middle and upper classes. Now, this finding made quite a big splash when it was um, released in the 1960s. Um, and this, this failure of smart but poor children to, to get into grammar schools and became known as the waste of talent. And, and this is a headline in a newspaper from the time, Britain's squandered treasury of talent. And the subhead reads, a well-researched book today shatters any conceptions of a classless society and focuses attention on the thousands of school children who will never have a chance. Now, now, that book it refers to uh, was called The Home and the School. It contained the, these cohort results, and it really became something of a kind of must-read educational reference for teachers in training, social workers in training, and a lot of people actually remember that book still. Now, that study um, also went on and, and fed into, into policy and, and politics. And in 1965, the year after this book was published, um, that was when the Labour government drove through a massive expansion of the comprehensive schools, uh, which were designed to replace the, the 11 plus exam and the selective school system with a more one size fits all approach. And obviously today we have a little bit of a patchwork um, still. I, I think you know, we can say that as well as shaping the way that we give birth, these cohort studies also went on to shape our education system and the way that many of us have been schooled. Of course, I'm sure you know that the debate about whether selective education or, or comprehensive education is better for children is just as fierce now as it was when, when this was being published in the 1960s.
this is, again, David Ward, the, the cohort member I showed you. Um, here he has grown up now uh, with his own children. And, and one of the interesting things about these studies is the way that the questions that scientists ask um, of them change um, over time. And obviously, part of that is because the people in them grow up. So we want to know different things about them. We can't ask about schooling once they've grown up. Um, but they also reflect the way that um, society has changed and that the interests of scientists have changed as well. And one great example of that in, is around uh, smoking in pregnancy. So um, it's really interesting, actually, that when the first uh, cohort study was done, this was the 1946 one, no one thought to ask the women whether they smoked in pregnancy, uh, which seems surprising today, but it just was not an issue at the time. No one was making those connections to think that was a bad thing to do. But when the second study was launched in 1958, uh, the question was added. Um, and the story goes that the somewhat eccentric scientist who ran that um, study, just as the very first questionnaires were about to be sent to the printers and, and sent out to the nation, raced in and said, stop, I absolutely must add a question about smoking in pregnancy because he'd seen the very first sort of mutters about um, concerns about it in the medical literature. So the questionnaires were all called back at the last minute. The question was added and, and then out they went. It proved to be a very worthwhile delay um, because what they were able to do was, was have much more detailed information on women's smoking habits in pregnancy. And also, of course, they collected all the information about the tragic stillbirths and infant deaths that happened in that um, group of children. Now, it wasn't until the 1970s that they actually went and crunched all of that data because by this point there was a big debate about whether smoking in pregnancy caused harm to children. And the scientists were able to show convincingly that it was a problem. So they were able to show that um, women who had smoked during pregnancy were more likely to have children who were of slightly lower birth weight and that this also increased the risks of infant mortality. Um, and this was even when confounding factors such as social class or, or how many children a woman had had was taken into account. And they published a very influential paper on this in 1972 in the British Medical Journal, which really uh, convinced many scientists and, and doctors that this was a concern. And this poster that I'm showing you here was produced, a public health poster, as pretty much as a direct consequence of, of that study. So it really went on to change public health advice that was given to women and establish this idea that obviously we have today that smoking in pregnancy is dangerous. So it's really been saving lives ever since, although there is still work to do. Um, around 12% of women today still smoke in pregnancy. The final finding I want to talk about is really getting back to this theme I've already touched on about inequality. So in every cohort it's been found that the children who have been born into disadvantaged circumstances have tended to follow a more difficult path and by that I mean they've been more likely to struggle at school as I had mentioned, uh, more likely to struggle getting the good jobs, they've often suffered poorer health amongst many other things. And there was one quite famous book on the children who were actually born into the most disadvantaged households of all in the 1958 uh, generation. And they found that many of these were already suffering such difficult lives that they asked if these children were born to fail. And this book actually became a, a surprise bestseller um, back in the, in the early 1970s. Now, scientists have gone on to continue to explore this question in, in many ways. Um, and one recent and, and particularly controversial study from the cohorts, this was in the 2000s, suggested that it was actually becoming harder for children to escape a difficult background, um, or in other words, that social mobility had declined. And the aim of that work was actually to examine um, the income of parents and then look at the income of their children when the children had grown up. And they would ask basically whether the poor children had stayed poor as adults or whether they had managed to better themselves. And um, the result came as a shock. Um, it showed that the income of children born in 1970 was tied more tightly to the income of their parents than those who'd been born in the previous generation in 1958. So, in other words, it had become harder for these children born in 1970 to escape from their background. Now, this finding um, is actually quite controversial. Um, some academics question whether it's correct or question whether this is an appropriate measure of social mobility because there are other ways to look at it. But it also ended up having quite um, an impact because it landed in the 2000s just as the discussion that we're having about inequality was kind of taking off. And it, it helped drive some of today's political focus on improving social mobility and increasing life chances. So, so a lot of that discussion, this sort of idea that social mobility is in decline, some of that can be traced back to these studies. Now, I also think, um, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, these studies have also struck something of a note of optimism by showing that actually children are not necessarily born to fail. Um, you know, not everyone, as you know, born in difficult circumstances ends up in difficult circumstances. There are routes to escape. 
and, and scientists are working very hard to understand what those are. And evidence from these studies and many other places has pointed to the importance of, of parenting, actually, parental interest and engagement in ch with children, particularly in the first few years of life, and suggested that sort of interested, engaged parents might compensate to some extent for a disadvantaged start. So, for example, one study of disadvantaged children born in 1970 um, showed that those whose parents had read to them when they were five and who'd shown um, a real interest in their education when they were 10 were much less likely to be in poverty when they reached the age of 30. That was rather a whistle-stop tour through four key findings, birth, schooling, um, smoking, and social mobility. But in my final section, I just do want to talk about um, a more human story by introducing you to one of the people who is in the, the studies. And, and that, in some way, takes us right back again, actually, to the beginning of, of this story. Now, the challenge is that their identities is con confidential, of course, as it should be. Um, but there are some people who um, are happy to reveal that they're cohort members, and I was able to talk to some of them. And, and that was actually really interesting because um, you find that um, sometimes you know, their lives mirror the findings of the studies, but often they don't. And that's because these studies look at trends across the group, um, but they can't tell us what's going to happen or, or what will happen for an individual um, person. So perhaps my favourite story is about a woman called Patricia Palmer, and uh, here she is as a 16-year-old, and she was born in 1946 in this first cohort. She was born at home in Cheltenham, in the family bed uh, with just a midwife to help her mother with the birth and no pain relief, um, all of which was very common at the time. As I explained earlier, this cohort study showed that working class women tended to receive worse medical care, um, and that was really true for Patricia's mother. She received the most basic care. Patricia was the fifth child um, to, born to her mother. Um, she'd already had one stillborn child, and one of her children had already died, which was, again, very common then because infant and child mortality were much higher then than they are now. And Patricia faced a lot of disadvantages, so I think you could argue that she was born to fail. They were a working-class family. Her father drank. He gambled. He often didn't bring home any money. Um, and then he left home when Patricia was five, and he died shortly after. So the family was left with very little money, and Patricia remembers very vividly uh, being embarrassed because she wore third-hand clothes, and she was the one who was having free school meals. Now, I mentioned that discovery from the 1946 cohort into which she was born uh, that showed that working-class children were more likely to fail their 11-plus exam. Patricia failed her 11-plus, and now she vividly, again, remembers uh, the day of the exam. She thinks her teacher had written her off because he actually hit her on the day of the exam and left her trembling. And it was no surprise to her that she failed it. Um, and perhaps even if she had passed, she wouldn't have gone to grammar school because her brother passed the 11 plus, but her mother couldn't afford to buy the blazer and cap and tie that was necessary for him to go to grammar school. Now, I also explained, of course, how these studies have shown that many children born into disadvantage tend to go on and struggle in life. But Patricia doesn't feel that did happen for her. She feels that she beat the odds. Um, and for her, life turned out OK, partly because of chance, partly because she inherited a work ethic from her mother. She did well at secondary school. Uh, she went on to get various jobs. She ended up managing the finances for a large school. She had uh, three children. And here she is in a nice photo with two of them. And I, I went to visit Patricia a couple of years ago. And I want to show you her today. She is now a friendly, lovely 70-year-old um, living on the outskirts of Cheltenham. She's very happy with how her life has gone. She's getting tired, picking up her grandchildren from school and you know, going to the gym in the morning to, to stay healthy. And she also feels really proud for being part of this amazing study. The main reason I wanted to tell you her story is just that it reminds us that ultimately these studies are about ordinary people like Patricia leading very ordinary lives, but that when you collect information on thousands and thousands of them over time, you end up with really, really valuable data for scientists, which hopefully allows them to begin to understand why people's lives in general tend to follow particular paths. Now, earlier this month, I went to the 70th birthday party of this group of which Patricia is part. They're um, really an amazing group of people. They feel like Patricia. They just feel so special for being part of this study. It's really become part of their lives. And the cohort studies are just completely dependent on the goodwill of these people. You know, if they didn't take part and fill in the questionnaires, these studies would collapse. And it just seems remarkable to me that this group, um, that they're just entirely unruffled that these scientists want to follow them on and on until they die. But they feel like their mothers signed them up for this study, and it's their duty to, to see it through to the last.
So that's really all I have time to say. Um, I've given you a, a small taste of, of the riches of these studies. I hope I've convinced you that amazing things happen when we do something as simple as track people through their lives and that these studies have really produced a, a wealth of important findings as well as being full of really fascinating human stories. <laughs>